Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the August edition of The Common Room. As you can tell from my robe, we are recording this one rather early in the morning, so it didn't seem right to do the breakfast scotch, so I think most of us have got soft drinks. Um, and as you can tell from my robe... Caffeinated. Dun, da, 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 da. Yeah, David, David I'm a huge in. nerd. He did yes. really watch, and I'm like, is this like a yellow version of a Hugh Hefner <laughs> robe? As <laughs> long as he stands you don't, up and shows um, the corner. <laughs> Uh, as long as you choose not to boldly split all infinitives. <laughs> never, never. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, how are you all doing? Matt, how are you? <laughs> Stunned. <laughs> Stunned. Good. Actually, as we record this, I'm getting ready to go to Ireland next week. Oh, Ooh, man. Days. I'm very excited. I've been looking Where are forward you going? For a while. Uh, Limerick, Galway, Killarney, and then finishing in Dublin with Notre Dame is playing Navy there in the oh, stadium. Oh, in London. So it's, there'll be a bunch of Notre Dame people there. Uh, it, it'll just be fun to be in Dublin. Honestly, it's funny. The thing I'm probably most excited for, of course, all the touring and stuff and the different sites, but is just the pub scene, getting a Guinness in these different pubs. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Weatherspoon. Where's this? Write this down. Weatherspoon. Okay. Write it down, <laughs> Weatherspoon. I'll send you a link. Um, it's a it's a pub finder. So this is a company that has bought a bunch of traditional old pubs, and then you can. It's got maps. You can walk to. There's Weatherspoons all over London. Ooh. Fish and chips is generally three or four pounds cheaper than what you get in a normal pub, and it, the food quality is great. You can order everything. This is an app for introverts in london you can go to your table it's numbered enter your table number order everything and pay for it all on the app and so you never Without have to ever shoulder... actually interacting with another human being right it's not very sacramental right? andrew it's not very yeah, sacramental. i was going to say this doesn't sound very <laughs> hey, hey you know the the food and drink of the gods you know that's, that's... <laughs> oh my all eating and drinking is sacramental you know <laughs> so and Emily Dickinson says, the soul selects her own society, then shuts the door. <laughs> so, yeah. But C.S. Lewis says that two isn't even the best number for friends. Keep inviting more people in. You already have a common interest, pubs. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That is my number one beef with the United States. Oh, there is no pubs. Really? I'll, I'll tell you mine afterwards. Go on. Okay, well, <laughs> it's, it's, it is con <laughs> it's continued frustration. I mean, after spending that year in England... I mean, pubs are just so much better than bars. I don't understand mm. how we haven't embraced pubs. I like the, the circular lower top tables that you sit around in threes, honestly. Oh, yeah. And you just get these different pints. There's great pints. You know, bars just suggest harder drinking, <laughs> in my opinion. I hear bar, oh, and I yeah. think you got to get a mixed yeah, drink yeah, yeah. or a cocktail or something. It's like a pub. I'm just getting a pint, and it's just mm -hmm. more relaxed. There's a smell of bars that's like stale old alcohol, but a smell yeah. of a pub is wood and yes. it smells primarily of beer or ale, but also it smells of food. You know, there's a little mm -hmm. bit of grease mm -hmm. smell from the frying of the fish. And it just is something, it, it just seems much more homey. But Weatherspoon, it's a lot of good traditional pubs that have been there for a long time. And then this one com company, you know, kind of bought them all. So great way to find a reliable meal um, and I don't a, wanna... a reliable pint. Hijack this conversation in silence. But why do you guys think the United States has not embraced the pub scene? I've actually wondered this. It seems like if someone were to actually just build some pubs, people would love them. Or is it our personality of individualism, hyper work focused? We don't think of leaving work at five and going to a pub in the evening. What do you think it is? I think I could point to a few things because the pub grows up inside the village. So yeah. everyone's in walking distance anyway. Right. And Graphical. it is the village. It is the entire set of society that would be there. So things like beer gardens and there are areas of the pubs where children can also come, come in. Sure. And the fact you can also get a meal there. Everything is just much more set to be communal. Whereas I would say in the typical American bar, you you drive there and the focus is, as you say, primarily on drinking you know it's it's not so much of the of the whole community gathering together uh, at at a watering hole yeah mm. yeah no i think that it's primarily geographical and the parish and the pub are the center of you know of center of village life for so many years 
and for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And then also think about the development of American society. And we're only born in the 17, late 1700s. And in the late 1800s, you got the Industrial Revolution. Henry Ford comes along. And now mm. we're spread out. Because a pub is, by definition almost, at least a local, is by definition yeah. walking distance. And mm -hmm. we don't have walking distance villages. We have a car-based society. You know? yeah, and so that, if I could walk one. to... You know, uh, there's a there's a grocery plaza with a Publix, you know, right around the corner. And we walk there for groceries all the time. But there's not even a bar there, much less a pub. <clears throat> um, but if there was, you know, if it were English society, there would be a pub in that, you know, in that uh, in that plaza. So mm. I, would, I would also add that uh, licensing laws and drinking ages also make an impact there. The way that yeah. the drinking ages move so late in the states, um, whereas in England it's it's a good deal lower, and it even varies on depending upon what kind of alcoholic drink you're drinking, whether or not you have an adult with you, and whether or not you're ordering food. The the rules are much more complicated, but it does then, I say it 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 makes it much more of an integrated part of society, not something that you do at the very end of adulthood, the very last thing that you're actually allowed to do. That makes sense. Um. I know we need to move on, but um, <laughs> trying to trying to look out. Oh, okay, so rigidity. the pubs developed. Um, uh, the pubs developed as a public house as opposed to like a private club that you had to pay to, mm -hmm. um, and so it becomes a little bit more democratic, um, and so a little bit more you know certainly other people, which is what democratic means. David, so, did you I, listen to the uh, recording I did with the the other? Not the yet. Gentleman? Not yet. Okay. We'll, we'll, we we'll talk, talk about, about that actually in a moment. Pub. I just want to put a bow on this pub discussion yeah. because yeah. Andrew's point about um, the pub and the parishes and the link between the two is very true. And uh, we would often say that you first of all go to your parish church for, for, for the service and then you go to the pub because it's thirsting after righteousness. Oh, wow. And my favorite breakfast ever was in November, right after the Memorial Stone at Westminster Abbey. Um, and I went to High Latin Mass at St. Aloysius at the uh, oratory the, um, uh, with Walter Hooper. And um, then afterwards went to the Eagle and Child for the best pint of stout I'd ever had. And there was a holiday festival on St. Giles there. So the whole street was shut down and people were milling around. There was kind of a fine mist, almost snow, but uh, fine mist falling. There was traditional carols up on a stage that they had set up. And my breakfast was a pint of stout at the uh, at the Eagle and Child, a Cornish pasty um, from the from the from the Cornish pasty company, and literally chestnuts roasted over an open fire. Um, so, yeah, it can't get much more English than that. Yeah, we know how to live. Uh, yes, you do, Matt. You mentioned uh, your recording with the C.S. Lewis Book Club. Would you mind telling people a little bit about that? Yeah, one, it was fun. We'll see what David leaves in. We roasted him a little bit. I heard, I heard that bit as I was trimming trimming the ends to send to our audio engineer. I didn't think there was anything bad. It was all fun because we're roasting and self-deprecating myself and them. But they have a very similar dynamic. Mm -hmm. It was like everyone honestly, has a match. It was, it was a freak, it was, well, and a David. It was kind of freakish how. But not everybody similar. has an Andrew. Oh, <laughs> no, I'm not sure everyone I, needs an Andrew. That, there's an good or ill. There's an interview that's coming out with uh, the Lamppost Listener guys, and we also discuss that dynamic. And they say, yes, but you've got an Andrew Lazo. We don't have that. That doesn't fit into our <laughs> equation at all. It's like a wild card. But <laughs> genuinely, Alex and Dan have the same. And, and what was even more, honestly, freakish about it was Dan is a finance individual. He's very similar to myself. There was like three or four things that I realized over the entire conversation. And I'm also going to Salt Lake City in a month and a half for a wedding, mm -hmm. and I'm actually adding on two days for vacation, so I'll probably meet up with them Wonderful. quickly before I go to Park City. Um, but it was just so funny, and yeah, Dan, Alex is much more like yourself, and good looking, yeah. articulate, <laughs> yeah. humble, yeah, humble, humble. No, so the short answer: it was fun, and what I what I got from it, by the way, listeners, is it's. It's a very different format than ours, like three mm -hmm. episodes to do all of the Out of the Silent Planet. So if you want to go and 
just get Fast some high dirty, level yeah. themes to be able yeah. to experience the book at a high level before diving <clears> into <throat> it. I think it's a wonderful dynamic. It's obviously mm-hmm. different than what we do, so it's very complementary, mm-hmm. and yet with with similar personalities. And so that was that was fun. They also That's have great. the winning combination without an Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I love and how they the, were both the in podcast. the. Uh, by the way, Andrew, they were both in the fallen camp, um, okay. <laughs> and I told them. Yeah, and I told I, them we need to do what I told. I didn't tell them what I was. I did say our listeners. We've had probably ten. What David? Maybe ten people send in or in an our, our listeners were probably sixty forty non fallen. Yeah. Um, and then I told him Jerry Root. So it's very fifty fifty. And I told him Jerry Root, and I, I said Jerry Root and Andrew should do a conversation. Honestly, I think yeah. it would be a, a, a wonderful conversation yeah, yeah. because setting aside the debate of whether it's fallen or not, the yeah. conversation of what it means to be fallen would be incredibly See, that's, informative. And that's the thing. As we've been listening, or, you know, looking at our feedback from last season and stuff, and and we understand that some of our listeners are getting tired of the debate between the real best book and blah blah blah. Um, <laughs> Hey, nice sip, but I didn't mention it by name. <laughs> but I think that um, Lewis's point, and of course I bring it up all the time, but define and describe. I think that a lot of the Inklings debates probably devolved into, or <clears throat> if you think about it, evolved into defining and describing. What do you mean by best? What does he mean by far and away? Um, what do you mean by fallen? And I think that a long conversation about fallenness And is death included in fallenness? Is there death in an unfallen world? You know, and I think that those are the kinds of debates because I don't think it has to be oppositional or binary. And I think that that's like David was saying, um, uh, the best friends are not two. It's a third or a fourth. You know, there's an exponential factor when you get lots of different opinions. And so I think that maybe this season we should avoid the strictly binary debates and maybe delve a little bit into more, you know, what do we mean by, which is something I think that would have been part of all of those conversations and fascinating, I think. So this would be a good time to say too, even though probably one 20th or one 30th of our actual podcast listeners come to YouTube to watch this. For those that do, let's set the record straight. There is zero competitiveness between us on these conversations i think one or two of them thought like we actually were competitive oh, gosh. maybe maybe there are for you i no. i feel zero with the the great divorce until we have face on it's just a funny yeah, yeah, yeah. long-running joke um but i don't I, maybe it comes across that way um and there's an interesting letter from tolkien to lewis i think one of the only surviving ones and they talked about having a conflict and um Lewis said, oh, good Lord, man, there's no need, you know, for me to forgive you anything. I was just tired and whatever. And I love hearing the roar and knowing that one could Mm -hmm. dive right in. And going at it hammer and tongs is part of the expression of their um, of their friendship. And these were not athletic men in generally. Um, And so the competition of sparring with ideas and I would love to, you know, I think one of the major moments in my Lewis scholarship was having lunch with Jerry at Wheaton College and backing him into a corner and making him concede a point. You know, it's like, crap, I did that for Jerry? Oh my gosh, you know, and so, and he gleefully- I wanna see you, know, you guys talk about yeah, this. Yeah, I, I think it would be a great conversation. We should probably bring in a third as well, so. Not me, because I'm biased. Maybe David, I feel like <laughs> David could actually be a neutral, like just dive deeper into the questions. Ah, uh, yeah, um, Malcolm, we should bring him Malcolm. Oh, that would be an interesting one. You're right, yeah. I'm, I'm anyway. a scholar. You, by the way, if you guys want to see me competitive, probably my most competitive conversation ever was recently with my English friends. Uh, he lives in New York now on the you have another? healthcare system. No. Yes. <laughs> no. you, we, you have mentioned your other English channel before. It's kind of like the other <laughs> C.S. Lewis podcast. That's exactly we, right. we acknowledge its existence, but not its supremacy. Yes. But <laughs> yes. it was the... Uh, I, the, get, the, I know the feeling. The U.S. healthcare system versus the U.K. healthcare system. And you should see our back and forths in our text messages. We still love each other. I've done this wedding. But man, they get heated. <laughs> David, you would appreciate some of them. I'm sure. Anyways. Well, well, we've got a raft of things to talk about. Well, well yes. I mean, we'll, we'll see how much we get to because we're already halfway through. Uh, but the main piece of C.S. Lewis related news that's been in the media for the last mm, few weeks at least is that Netflix finally show real signs of movement on 
the production of their Narnian adaptation. Mm-hmm. And specifically, Greta Gerwig appears to have been tapped for at least two movies. Um, She's the Barbie director. The yeah. Barbie director. She also did Lady Bird and the most recent adaptation of Little Women. Uh, and it seems from at least some sources that it's going to be the horse and his boy and the magician's nephew. And the fact that they've suggested the magician's nephew may mean that they're going to be doing this in chronological order, which I've gone on record. Now, I've gone on record as saying I'm okay. If they want to do the adaptation of the movie, they can they can fix all of the things that would make the book reading not work. Um, but we're going to leave that debate aside. I'm interested to know your thoughts on Greta Gerwig being the possible future director of the Narnian Chronicles, and have you seen any of her previous movies? Well, I want to just jump in and um, and bring up the the great or the discarded image, and also <laughs> Lewis's studies in medieval and Renaissance literature. Um, yeah, the great image. It's in um, there. It's in there. <laughs> what Lewis is doing. Uh, or Lewis talks about the job of a medieval writer, and in so doing, I think he's talking about the Inklings as well, especially him and Tolkien. He says that for a medieval author, the idea of originality was not even part of their you know, concept. They received an old story, and then they chopped off the bits that they didn't like and added to the bits that they did like and passed it on. So kind of the, the two supreme examples of this are Sir Thomas Mallory um, who writes um, uh, the, the, the Mort d'Arthur, The Death of Arthur. And he grabs all of the different stories, the Celtic stories, the Welsh stories, the, the you know, Beruel from France, Chrétien de Troyes, grabs all the Arthur stories, and then the parts he doesn't like, he tamps down, and then the parts he does, he adds to, and he passes it on as kind of one unified work where he's grabbing a bunch of authors, but going behind them to what he thinks the original story or myth really was and then he says okay they kind of got it wrong here let me transmit it better uh shakespeare in some ways is the ultimate medieval author if you will because 33 of his 36 plays are non-original plots these are stories that he got and then he and then he um kind of blew up into technicolor and i think that as a director of a movie which is a in some ways completely different role than an author of a book I think it's the, the director's right and, in fact, obligation to kind of go behind, grab the original story, add the parts that they like, delete the parts that they don't like, and kind of pass it along. Peter Jackson does a stumbling good you know, job of this. He admits Tom Bombadil. Um, he introduces more of the Arwen, you know, um, Aragorn story. Um, and so I think family. that if Greta Gerwig... Yeah, exactly. You know, there's there's some bad things. And that's part of what the next author would do. Hey, ruined Faramir. Let me make that movie in a better way. I think that a director has a right to change the story because I don't know that I want a shot by shot, scene by scene adaptation of any of the Narnias. I want them to be imaginatively sympathetic with the movies or with the books and really understand the essence of it and then film their version of that. Michael Apted, as a non-believer, um, I think that some of that informed the reason that um, that uh, that Voyage of the Dawn Treader was terrible. But I don't think that either he or Douglas Gresham, frankly, really got what that story was all about. Um, so the scene where where Eustace is dug out of his skin by Aslan's actual claw ends up being Aslan scratching on the ground. And it's like <laughs> you miss that whole yeah, that transformative, you know, conversion. But a director has a right to make changes and to tell their version of the story. I just hope that Greta loves the stories and really understands them from the inside. And, you know, if she needs an advisory panel, I think we'd be glad to, um, <laughs> to volunteer. I think yeah. I... I <clears throat> I agree with the statement they have a right to. The only thing I would say is um, if a book eventually, because of how competitive the landscape is, gets adapted to a movie, it's usually because the book was wildly popular, Uh which means readers liked it as is. And that's probably why I very rarely ever like an adaption to a movie, because every time they deviate, I think they make it worse. 
yeah. because the meritocracy of a book making it to the top of the echelon is already quite rare. Mm-hmm. And so they, they got some formula really right. And then to attempt to tweak that formula, I think they have a right to. And if they do it right, they're phenomenal. It's like every yeah. one out of 10 when you're yeah. like, oh my gosh, this was better than a book. Awesome. Ender's Game was a really good movie adaptation of the book. Yes. Shortened and a I bunch of Ender's scenes. And yeah. And I've read the book a dozen times, but mm-hmm. the movie really holds up. Um, so it's when like Andrew just, Adamson just had the... Yeah, it is. It is. And you have to be a really great artist as a director hmm. to know how to capture the essence of it, which is one question, and then portray it in, into a modern audience, which is another yeah. question. And then the third thing is to make something that the people who live and die by Narnia, like us and so many of us, um, to make something that we will love and embrace. And so if they do that well, I think that even Lewis would embrace some of the changes. Oh, you took Narnia and made it better um, is kind of what I'm hoping for from folks who love Narnia. I don't know. I'll shut up now. <laughs> what do you think, David? And I don't know who Greta is. I don't know her values. I don't know her skill set. Um, I have been told I need to see Barbie now. But well, people. see, this is, this is yeah. the funny thing, the fact that this is coming hot off the heels of uh, uh, coming off the hot off the high heels of the Barbie movie ah, because that, that that is a movie that has really split people I've seen oh, yeah. people denounce this as the most leftist rubbish they've ever seen and also oh my goodness this is all just um, conservatism sort of with a thin veneer over the top of it to make it attractive to suck us in I, I've seen radically different opinions about that movie oh wow Wow! But what that movie certainly does prove is that she's an artist. She can create arresting images. Uh, out of her previous movies, I've seen the Little Women remake. And there she departed uh, a little bit from the book and also from previous adaptations. But I did like the, adapta- I did like the adaptation that she did, mm-hmm. even if I didn't think it was, interestingly, the best because it was a different take on the book to allow you to look at the book in a different way. And I think that's the, that's the attitude I'm trying to hold on to throughout all of this, that even if something is done in a way that I don't think I would have done, if it gives me a different insight into the book, I'm gonna call that a win. Because like we, we haven't done the BBC adaptations yet. My goal is once we've finished reading all of the books, in subsequent seasons, like we did with The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, we'll talk about the media. We'll talk about the, the movie adaptations. And I do want Maybe to look at... Maybe we do a movie it. month. <sighs> That's a lot of movies. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like but, a movie month each season. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> but uh, but uh, when, uh, when, when we'll, when we'll uh, go through and we'll, we'll look at how the 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 Walden Media did their version, how BBC did their version. But I would note that one of the chief criticisms that most people have of the BBC, apart from their fantastic special effects, <laughs> is the fact that on some things they seemed a little bit too faithful to the book in terms of it seemed a little bit plodding. Yeah. That some yeah. of this stuff would work yeah. fine in the pages of a book, but not quite so well when right, you're trying to put it saying. up on the screen. Yeah. And the, the uh, animated version is pretty much a shot-by-shot remake. Hey, I just did a quick search on whether Greta Gerwig is a Christian, and um, the AP News has got an interview with her, and she says that her, uh, that her Catholic upbringing had a big mm-hmm. influence on Barbie. She says, in the movie, Barbie, like when it starts, she's in a world where there's no aging or death or pain or shame or self-consciousness, and then she suddenly becomes self-conscious. That's a really old story, and we know that story. And she says that she has a tendency to rely on these older story forms due to her Catholic upbringing in my hometown of Sacramento, California, by the way. So, Mm. so let's hope that that, that thing gives her a sensitivity to those, those stories and themes. Because that would be my only frustration. I'm fine with artistic creativity, trying to take a different angle. And honestly, I'm fine if you, you fail at it. I don't like when they try to re to put different political values or different values into something that the author never intended. Right. It's like, (laughs) all right, that's just really frustrating. The gender issues in Narnia are really delicately balanced and, and show a real progression of thought. And I, I think that there's a subtle generosity towards ideas of sexuality in those books that most people miss because they're chopping it up with a hatchet instead of with a scalpel. 
Well, the other thing that's going to be interesting is in, in, in light of the Rings of Power, because Amazon came out and produced Rings of Power, and I think it's safe to say it received a lot of negative feedback. And mm -hmm. also the, the podcasters and influencers who really championed it uh, got called lots of names, uh, and their integrity was questioned because they flew them all out to England for the premiere and to meet uh, all of the rest stars and stuff. So I just want to go on record as saying I am very happy to say whatever you want me to say about these new Netflix <laughs> movies if you give me a free ticket back home, particularly if I can take my family with me. So I just want to go on record as saying that. Uh, uh, pluralize <laughs> those pronouns. Pluralize those pronouns, buddy. Yeah. So I will maintain my integrity. One of us needs to. <laughs> All right. We'll go without Matt. Okay, David? We'll drink to him at a, at a proper pub while he's at a bar somewhere. Drinking mm. his white claw. <laughs> I will give you my non expert, naive, but nevertheless genuine opinion. And you can be assured of that. <laughs> but I, I do think I do think it'll be it'll be really good for Narnia. Once again, just getting people's eyeballs in front of something that they might not have encountered. Because I would say in recent years I've encountered more people, uh, more younger people who haven't actually been exposed to Narnia. And much in the same yeah. way that whatever one however one might view the success or failure of the rings of power it suddenly got tolkien and the lord of the rings in in front of a lot of people and in their heads yeah. and i can't remember what the statistic was but there were many more sales of the lord of the rings and yeah. the hobbit in yeah. the wake of the rings of power and i think for that any tolkien fan should be grateful even if they thought sure. that the rings of power was stupid um just yeah. that if it's getting a new audience to go and read the books it's a win. Yeah. Well, and the secondary effect of Joe Rowling's immense popularity with Harry Potter is that not only did people rapidly read Harry Potter and try to go through a Barnes and Noble today without bumping into Harry Potter stuff, um, <laughs> but it also encouraged students who normally didn't like to read, which is who I taught for 10 years, encouraged them to read and mm -hmm. gave them a reading experience that then let's hope at least a significant fraction of them will continue to reproduce. And so I do hope the movies drive, yeah, drive people back to the Narnias. And I have several sets for sale. So, you know, <laughs> you can cash in. I'm gonna... <laughs> sure, well, I was sure. actually about to joke. I'm going to create a pint to Jack controversial content strategy. Where we, we... <laughs> no, seriously, you know how, how you go viral through YouTube shorts by making controversial statements, we'll get these one to two minute clips where we will make very controversial statements about the show. They're going to pop up in the algorithm because they create vitriol, and I'm, and it's going to be perfect for Pines with Jack. We're going to gain notoriety through this. It's going to be the Andrew Tate method, except for Pines with Jack. <laughs> we just make these asinine statements. Well, you know what? We should just reach out to her and um, you know, let her know that we're available to help her along the way. Mm -hmm. and available for flights to England or New Zealand or wherever <laughs> it is that she would like to film these. <laughs> yeah. Well, and just having a voice, uh, I think, would be great. So. Mm. We didn't reach anything on our list, did we? <laughs> well, we one got one things. thing. Matt has yeah. also been reading just... a book. Yeah. <laughs> Should we do a second common room? <laughs> this is just so people know we were supposed to talk about the affection of sin from here at some point just read the book your life will be changed okay that's the short answer i'll, I'll, right. I'll move that onto the se september agenda for uh common room okay <laughs> you got a one right. month to read the book yeah. there you go a little bit of a warning good i love it all right well i will good. just sign off by saying that we've had some very fun conversations over text recently listeners viewers we have some very fun um special gifts that we're going to be giving to our Patreon supporters over the coming year. We've, we've got a couple of great things in the pipeline. So stay tuned for that. And please Some join us next time. Things. Oh, I would we'll be going further so. up and further, and further in. in. Cheers. <laughs>